I'm super excited tonight because we're going to be spilling the tea on all of the questions that you have about menopause and hormones and hormone replacement and perimenopause and when it starts and when it ends and what you can do and what's good for you, what's bad for you. There's so much misinformation out there. And then there's also, I don't know what it is, but before we hit puberty, we have to talk with our parents and there's a lot of education in school about what's going to happen to your body. So when you're a teenager girl or young preteen, you don't just start bleeding and think that you're dying. But we go through perimenopause and menopause and nobody talks to us. Our doctor doesn't warn us. Our colleagues, our fellow women, a lot of times they don't warn us. Our moms don't really talk about it. Our moms, you know, I'm 49 and my mom didn't talk about her period with me. I mean, it was kind of taboo back then to even talk about any of your lady parts. Now I feel like the generation coming up, the millennials and below, they are more open about talking about their bodies and more and more women are starting to speak out about our rights as women in menopause. We can't possibly live from perimenopause starts at around age 35, 40. Our hormones start to decline around age 30 for most people. Some people are going to have early menopause and going to it much earlier, but the average for most women, you know, start declining around 35 and then around 40, you're going to start into perimenopause. And so when you think about it, 40 years old is like halfway through your life. It's even less than that because we're living to 80, 90, 100 now. And I can't think of one other hormone in the body, like your thyroid, your pancreas makes insulin. Now, if you couldn't make thyroid hormone anymore, your doctor would give you thyroid hormone replacement. If you could not make insulin anymore, you get insulin to replace it. But female hormones are kind of overlooked. We're told It's just how it is when we're getting older, it's all in our head and women are really not given the correct information and they're not given the opportunity to make the decision for themselves. So I never want to push any specific modality of care, but I need you to know it's your body and your body deserves to have what it needs to, to survive. Now, hormone deficiency is really what menopause is. It's a hormone deficiency. And the reason why it happens, it's it's a natural process, so it's not a disease, but it wasn't that long ago that women would die pretty soon after reproductive years. And so we were just baby makers. And then once our baby making equipment was done, 55, 60, it wasn't uncommon for people to die around that time frame, 50 from 55 to 65. And that was considered a decent life. Now, fortunately, we are living much longer, but the medical system and the training that doctors get have not caught up. Doctors are still of the opinion that women don't need hormones and that they can just live the rest of their life without hormones. Now, if this is a male issue, if men, if their penises were shrinking and their balls were shrinking up, they would be, it would be like a national emergency. They would be stop the process. We're going to have little kiosks on each corner in the cities, giving out testosterone for these men, but women We have vaginal atrophy, we have pain with sex, we have vaginal dryness, we have increased rates of heart disease, dementia, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, diabetes, the list goes on and on, and even increased rates of cancer. Now, there are some questions I'm going to answer about cancer and breast cancer and hormones and where the confusion comes in. So we'll talk about that in a second. Hey, everybody, I see you're all coming in. If you're watching the replay, um, go ahead and post your questions below the video and I will answer them throughout the week. Awesome. Okay. So that was kind of my little soapbox of why we're doing this and why I love doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a couple of questions that were just the most common questions this week. And so one of the questions was just about bloating and why do we get bloating? Like, why do we have, I'm not talking about the belly fat. So that's another issue when it's actually fat, but the bloating where you feel like you have a balloon in your stomach and this kind of starts happening around perimenopause and menopause. It can definitely happen earlier, especially if you had really difficult periods, you might've been really bloated that last week before your period during that the luteal phase, right before you start bleeding, but it's really more common in women who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, kind of that little pregnant looking belly that just sticks out. And what causes that, well, you know what I'm gonna say, hormone deficiency definitely is at play there because our hormones, our estrogen and progesterone are super important for gut motility, for the ability for 
your food to move through your system. Now, estrogen it is really necessary for bile to be released into the intestines to help break down food. So bile helps to break down our fat. And if you can't break them down, they kind of sit in the intestines and they can start to ferment and putrefy. And then they can start forming gas. So now you get gas, you get bloating and you're feeling uncomfortable. You might be constipated because you don't have that bile moving. You don't have the uh, peristaltic action moving your bowels along and you can be constipated then. And then you can have alternating constipation and diarrhea, which is common with SIBO, which is a side effect of the food not moving through your bowels. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is water retention. So water retention is like where you just feel bloated all the time and you're retaining water. And this can happen in your ankles. It can happen in your belly. It can happen all over. And lack of progesterone there is huge because progesterone is a little bit of a diuretic. And so lack of progesterone can cause this bloating and water retention. Now, it's important to note when you first start, if you were to start hormone replacement therapy, sometimes the fluctuation or the change to hormones can make you retain some water for uh, the first month or so. And what you can do there is do something like dandelion root tea that helps to kind of like flush the body. Also drinking more water and getting some exercise. It doesn't have to be super aggressive exercise. It can be going for walks, sitting in the sauna, just moving your body, doing yoga that helps to kind of flush the body. Also doing things like dry brushing and castor oil packs can be super helpful for releasing the bloating and that water retention. And so those are a couple of things that you can do and a couple of reasons why we have that bloating. Drinking water, definitely when you're bloating, it sounds like something you don't want to do because you're already retaining water, but it allows us to flush the water out. So if you think about, like, if you guys have a garbage disposal in your sink and you put the food in there and you turn this, this garbage disposal on, it's just going to kind of sit there. But if you run the water, it pushes it through. So there's a certain amount of water that will just make it sit there and kind of bubble up, but more water will push it through. So think about that when you need to, you just drink more water and it'll kind of flush things through and that could be super helpful. But hormone replacement therapy over the long haul can really help to aid with digestion. It can aid with less gas and bloating and more normal bowel movement. So it can be super helpful. And the other question that I got, this is super, super common question. I say, I get this probably every week, every two weeks, and it is about estrogen and it being dangerous. So there is a lot of fear around hormones and that hormones are bad for you. Hormones are dangerous. Hormones cause cancer. So it's breast cancer awareness month. So estrogen and cancer is a huge, huge topic. So why is this? So for, for many, many years, up until about 1970, estrogen was actually used to treat cancer, which you may not know around 1970. I'm not sure of the exact date, but in the early seventies, tamoxifen, that the drug that is like suppresses cancer or suppresses estrogen that came out then. So up until then, they used actually estrogen to treat metastatic breast cancer and it worked really well. So what happened in 2002 was there was a study called the Women's Health Initiative. So you might've heard of it. And in this study, they had two arms of the study. They had one arm that they gave synthetic estrogen orally that was horse derived estrogen. So it was conjugated equine estrogen called permarin. It was what they prescribed mostly at that time. And so the synthetic oral estrogen made from horse urine, that was one arm of the study. And in those women, they didn't have a uterus. So they were women with a, who had had a hysterectomy. So their uterus was removed. And the thought was that they don't need progesterone because they don't need to protect their uterus. And so that group just got the estrogen. Then the other group they had uteruses. And so they got the horse derived estrogen, the conjugated equine estrogen or primarin, and they also got a synthetic progestin. So not progesterone. This is a synthetic oral progestin. So chemical that is supposed to kind of act like progesterone. Now, after so a few years, they actually looked at the two groups and they found that the group who was using the conjugated equine estrogen plus the synthetic progestin, they had a slight increase in the breast cancer rate. So they actually had for every 1,000 women, instead of having a four in 1,000 
rate or four women out of 1,000 getting breast cancer, there was five women out of 1,000 who were using that combination of the conjugated equine estrogen and the synthetic progestin. Now in the other group, the estrogen only group or the equine estrogen only group, there was actually a decrease in the breast cancer rate, but they stopped the study because they were worried about women getting cancer and turned the study over to the press. And the press picked up on the fact that there was an increase in cancer from the progestin and equine estrogen group. And the big headline was hormone replacement therapy causes cancer. So all these women were yanked off their hormone replacement therapy and it got a bad name. Now, not too much later, about 10 years later, there is a, or not actually in 2019, there is a study or not a study, but a group of doctors in December 13th of 2019 in the annual San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, they actually presented the 19 year follow-up to the study. And there were many, many, many cancer centers, um, UCA, UCLA Medical Center, the National Institute of Health, all of these different doctors who actually showed that estrogens are actually breast protective against breast cancer. And it's a synthetic progestin that were causing that slight increase. And this was actually backed up by many, many, many institutions, including the Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, all these prestigious universities that were big names in cancer research actually backed that up. And the new, they actually thought you would think that in 2019, the headline would have been, oh my God, estrogen does not cause cancer. It'd be all over the news. Everyone will be talking about it. But when it got to the press, they actually only put the headline that the synthetic progestin caused cancer that was confirmed. And then deep down in the body of the article, it's like, oh, and by the way, the estrogen didn't cause cancer. So the, the fear just progressed. And, and there's a thing in psychology, whenever you hear something first. So as these doctors, they got this information from an authority, the National Institute of Health, that told them that hormones are bad. So now this, this message that hormones are bad is in their brain. And now any information that comes to them to kind of like go against what they believe they dismiss because it doesn't fit with what they already know. And so a lot of times doctors do not get continuing education about bioidentical hormones or menopause or perimenopause. Um, medical schools have less than one hour of training on menopause or perimenopause or anything after the reproductive years. Even gynecologists, they do not have any training at all on menopause and perimenopause, they have training on fertility and pregnancy and irregularities with the period and postpartum care, but that's where it ends. And so the only doctors, only about 20% of doctors in the whole country here in the United States, and it's true overseas as well, that actually have any menopause training. And this has to be done as elective training that we have to pay for after medical school. And so it's really quite quite confusing. Oh, so you don't want to use Primarin. Primarin is the name and then Provera is the synthetic progesterone. And so follow-up studies, what they actually showed is that oral estrogens can actually create clotting factors in the liver. So they have to go through your digestive system down to the liver and that creates something called a clotting factor. And that can lead to stroke and other conditions. And that's only with oral estrogens. When you use topical estrogens, they go straight into the bloodstream and they don't have to go through the, the mouth, down the esophagus, into the gut, through the liver. Now, when our ovaries release estrogen, they release it straight into the bloodstream. They don't go through the liver. And so that's a more natural process. People say, well, you know, what about if I have a risk for breast cancer, shouldn't I not take bioidentical hormones or estrogen? And the fact is, if you think about who gets cancer, it's not women who are at the height of the reproductive years. It's not women who are pregnant who have high, high levels of estrogen. It's women who are in menopause. So it's only after we are in a less estrogenic state that we're more at risk for breast cancer unless we take estrogen replacement that gives us protection. So pregnancy is one of the highest protections that you can get. Even women who have the BRCA genetic mutation that 
that makes them less able to stop the proliferation of cancer development. Even those women, it's found that if they have pregnancy or one or more pregnancies, they have a much reduced risk. So pregnancy actually, it's a huge hormone exposure and it actually protects against breast cancer. And then not having a baby at all actually is a, increases your risk of breast cancer by 30%. And the reason why is because you don't have that big influx, that big surge of estrogen and progesterone. And so that's what they found to be super, super protective. And one of the pregnancy hormones is actually called estriol. So estriol is a type of estrogen. So estradiol is the type of estrogen that does most of the things that we talk about when we talk about hormone replacement therapy, when we talk about bone health and repair, repairing collagen and heart health and hot flashes and all of the things that we talk about hydrating the body. That's estradiol. Now, estriol is a weaker estrogen, but it's a helper estrogen. And it's found that that is super protective against cancer. And so in our practice, when we replace estrogen, we replace it in a combination of estradiol and estriol. And that is the best cancer productive way that you can actually prescribe estrogen topically. And so, you know, estrogen, like I said, has been used to treat metastatic breast cancer. It was like super, super successful. Started in the forties up until the seventies. And then in 1974, tamoxifen replaced it. And there's studies that many studies that show that if you actually get breast cancer while you're on hormone replacement therapy, you have a much higher rate of recovery and a less chance of dying over women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and have not been on hormone replacement. And the cool thing is, even if you were on hormone replacement for five to seven years, and then you went off of it, it actually gives you protection for a long, long time. That's why the pregnancy gives you protection, even though you're not currently pregnant. And the final thing is what about estrogen receptive breast cancer, ER positive breast cancer? And the funny thing about that is, and this is not widely known, is if you look at the science, if you dig really in, all breast cells have estrogen receptors in them. And so if a breast cell was to get cancer, if it becomes a tumor cell, then it's still gonna have estrogen receptor until it mutates enough that that estrogen receptor is no longer there. So it's actually good if there's estrogen receptor in there, because that means that the cell hasn't mutated that much. It's actually stem cells. There's these cancer stem cells that actually initiate tumor growth. It's not estrogen at all that initiates the, the tumor growth. That's why estrogen is actually protective of breast cancer. There's actually a lot of research on this in one of my favorite people who have done tons of research on this and tons of documentation. Her name is Dr. Berkson and she's out of Texas. And she actually wrote this really well laid out and easy to understand paper called Estrogen Vindication. And I'll make sure that I share that with this replay, but she's really done a great job. She was there at that 2019 symposium and she's, she actually has breast, had breast cancer and does take hormone replacement therapy. So she's done a really great job of sharing a lot of information, educating doctors, and I follow her. And I think she's really great at explaining the science. So I'm going to answer some questions here. Let's see. Would you approach BHRT any differently as someone with mast cell activation syndrome, also a history of migraines and endometriosis, age 49, all hormones are testing low. Actually with mast cell activation syndrome, there's a lot of inflammation in the body and estrogen is very anti-inflammatory. So I would definitely, because you're going to be sensitive to a lot of things, I would definitely start on a low dose. And in our practice in the Healthy Hormone Club, we tend to start people who have a lot of sensitivities on a lower dose, but then we check back and we gradually can increase them. Also, progesterone is a great treatment for migraines. So progesterone is used a lot of times in high doses for people with migraines of all ages. And I really think that hormone replacement therapy can be helpful for you, but you just want to work with somebody who will work with you individually. You don't want to just go on. A lot of doctors will give you a standard dose. You definitely want to, don't want to do pellets because pellets are usually very high dose hormones and they usually don't have progesterone. It's just usually testosterone and sometimes estrogen and they're implanted. So it's basically 
this little tiny, like compressed little pellet. It looks kind of like if you've ever had a rabbit or been to a pet store, it looks like rabbit food and they have to make an incision usually in your butt and they will insert it. And so once it's inserted, guess what? It can't be taken out. So the high dose of hormones gets flushed into your system. And that would not be um, recommended for you. And I also would not recommend oral hormones. I'd recommend topical because they are the most, they're easiest to adjust. So you can adjust down if you are feeling like you're sensitive, you can adjust up super easy and they're real easy to apply and kind of customize for you. And they don't have any of that clotting factors with the liver. They don't make any of the harmful metabolites that are a lot safer. Um, can depression and anxiety be caused by hormone imbalances? Absolutely. It's one of the most common symptoms actually of hormone decline. And unfortunately it's not talked about. And the other unfortunate thing is standard of care in the United States for a woman who is gaining weight, not sleeping, starting to have hot flashes, having some digestive issues, even if she hasn't changed her diet, feeling fatigued, standard of care is to give her antidepressants and not check her hormones and not, those are all very, very common symptoms of perimenopause. And yeah, definitely estrogen and progesterone and testosterone from some matter are very important for your brain health. So estrogen, what it does is it actually enables your brain to utilize glucose for energy. And they've done brain scans showing women who are causal age who are not on hormone replacement or in women who are on hormone replacement and women who are pre in the reproductive years. I'm not menopause yet. And the menopausal women who are not supplementing with any hormones, they have a lot of amyloid plaques in their brain. So a lot of areas of their brain that are kind of shut down. And the other thing that happens is your hippocampus, which is really important for your sense of self, it actually shrinks. In women, a lack of estrogen shrinks your hippocampus. In men, lack of testosterone shrinks their hippocampus. When you're thinking about like, well, women versus men, how come women have such a harder time with perimenopause and menopause and men seem to not have as much mood swings, depression, anxiety, all of that. It's because our hormones, they're going along normal and then they whoosh, go straight down. It's that abrupt, very abrupt change. Progesterone is a very calming hormone. And so that's the first one to go usually and that can start in causing anxiety. It starts causing a lack of sleep insomnia. And then when estrogen drops as well, then you can't stay asleep. Then you have all kinds of other like memory issues, brain fog, fatigue, achy joints, tinnitus, headaches. So this is on and on. Who would not be depressed and anxious, especially when you don't know this is going to happen to you. There's actually over 99 documented symptoms of menopause from head to toe, all over our body. Every cell of our body has hormone receptors and it's, it's definitely a very, very important part of our life. Even our mitochondria, which are the energy centers of the brain or the body, the powerhouses, they require estrogen to work. And so it's super important. Let's see. Oh, Amina, nice to have you here. Are topical hormones better than inserts? I think you're talking, when you say inserts, I think you're talking about pellets, but you might be talking about vaginal inserts. So there's vaginal hormones. Those most of the time vaginal hormones are going to stay local to the vaginal mucosa. So they're going to do a lot of help with vaginal dryness. They're going to be super helpful for vaginal atrophy, painful sex, reducing UTIs, all of those things. And in our practice, we use both vaginal and topical hormones, whether they're better. Well, if you're having symptoms like bone loss, brain fog, hot flashes, hair loss, any of those things, any of the like systemic, you're going to probably want to use a combination of vaginal and topical hormones. And then if you're talking about pellets, I just talked about that a second ago. So I, you, you probably asked the question before I talked about it. Let's see how long before I would feel the benefits of hormone treatment. Everybody's going to be different. So some women feel it, they, some, some of your symptoms, you might feel relief the first week. A lot of times like trouble sleeping, as long as the cause of the symptom is the progesterone loss or the loss of estrogen, then you see those results right away. But if you're having trouble sleeping and you have someone in a rock band who lives upstairs from you and he's playing the drums all night, you're probably not going to see benefits from trouble sleeping. So it depends what else is going on in your body, but generally I would say like, give it three to four months before you're going to like really judge it. And then some symptoms like hair loss that can take six to nine months to see a difference. 
weight gain, the abrupt or very quick weight gain should slow down. So the rate at which you're gaining weight, but if you want to lose the weight you gain, the hormones aren't really going to burn fat or, or lose the weight for you. You do have to, you know, change your diet a bit. You do have to get to the gym and exercise and that weight will fall off a lot easier. You'll be a lot, it would be a lot easier to put on muscle, you know, but it'd be a lot easier to kind of fix those things, but it's not just going to fall off. It will stop you from gaining weight rapidly. Things like bone density that takes over a year. So a year, a one to two years of consistent use, you should see a difference on your DEXA scan and those results will compound. Hot flashes, Usually within the first month, you should notice decreases. And then by three to four months, they should be pretty, I mean, you're still going to get a hot flash once in a while, especially if you drink coffee or alcohol, or you have like a trigger that might cause your hot flashes. There's other things like low omega threes that can be a, a root cause for hot flashes, low vitamin D, hot weather, but you should start to see improvement. And then of course, with our, with, with our practice and a lot of good hormone replacement doctors who are really versed, they're going to adjust your dose. So there's no way to know exactly what dose you need the first time because everybody absorbs and utilizes and metabolizes hormones a little differently. But even if you have two women who are the same height, the same weight, the same stress level, neither of them are on any medications or anything like that. And they both come in with the same level of hormones. They're both menopausal. They both have pretty low hormones across the board. You can give them the same doses. And for one woman, it'd be too high. And the other woman would be just right. So it's always about like communicating with your practitioner. Make sure that they're looking at not just your test results, not just your symptoms, but a combination of the two. So you want to be looking at the whole woman. So we want to even look at things like in our practice, when we look at your profile, we're looking at thyroid, we're looking at any medications you're taking. The price for show is here. We're looking at the whole picture and awesome. So you guys, I'm going to, let's see, you've got the price for show. You want to come here? Yeah. Oh, let me turn this. Let me take this off for a second. I got the Q&A. Awesome. So you want to, do you have any riddles today or are we going to pick the prize today? We're just going to pick a name. Sure. Do you want them to type something in the chat and you pick from the, when they type in the chat, you want to do that? Yes. Okay, you guys. So right now in the chat, cat, cat, cat. So C A T. Put cat in the chat. We'll wait like a couple of seconds. And so what I was saying, I'm just gonna finish what I was saying, but you can you can hold this because it's the first thing we're gonna give away. But you can still stand here. It's fine. So we want to look at the entire picture. We want to look at your symptoms. We want to look at your hormones. We want to look at how sensitive you are. We want to look at your goals. Okay. Oh, this is what we're giving away. This is called. Omega-3 high potency. We just talked about omega-3, how it can help with hot flashes and also help with inflammation. This is from, whoa, it's from Mind Body Green. Oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> it's from Mind Body Green. It's in a glass bottle because they are super concerned about environment and making sure you don't have any plastics around. So it's pretty cool. And it's a really good supplement. So you can pass them. We got some cats here. So you can pick one. Can yeah. Pet me. Cat, okay, Jessica Romero, you have one. Yeah, <laughs> you have one that omega threes. So all you have to do is email support at glownaturalwellness.com. Let us know you won the omega threes and where to send it with your address, and we'll send them out to you right away. Yeah. All right, we have another one. All right, we're gonna do we're gonna do daily glow. This is my favorite. Well, of course, my favorite because I formulated it, but my <laughs> hormone. <laughs> Adrenal, immune, and thyroid support multivitamin has adaptogenic herbs, has DIM for estrogen detox, yeah. all your vitamins and minerals. Yum, 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 yum. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> you guys know how to get them. <laughs> 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 Who are you going to pick? What do you think? It's going really fast. What do you think? Anyone. Anyone. I want you to pick. No, no, I'm... This one? Yeah. All right, Wendy, if your name is Wendy and you wrote me out with two E's and three O's, you won the Daily Glow supplement. This is really, really good. It replaces, if you take a bunch of supplements, it'll replace so many of them, save you a ton of money. Well, it's free, so it'll save you a ton of money. And now we're going to give out a free hormone, free hormone test. Free hormone test so you can see where your levels are. <laughs> uh, we're tra I'm crazy. <laughs> All right, do I pick the free hormone test? 
And if you're watching on the replay, we're going to give you prizes too. So make sure you put Pat in the chat as well. And you can write Pat some little message sometimes. He gets, he likes to see his name. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> the funny one. The Pat to this crazy one? Yeah. Mimi, Yao, Pat. Okay, Kelly Perry. You have won a free hormone test. So again, email support at Blue Natural Wellness. Let us know you want the free hormone test kit. We will need your name, your birth date, and your address so we can send you your hormone test kit. You're going to be able to test your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone levels, see where you're at, so you can make decisions about what to do next. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Paxton. All right. Now I have to find the actual question. <laughs> All right. So congratulations to everyone who won. We usually do this like every time I do a Q and A, cause I think it's, you know, it's nice to win stuff. I always loved when I would win stuff. And I find that a lot of times online, like the people make you buy stuff to win stuff. And I always think like, if you're showing up to educate yourself about your hormones, I want to reward you for that. And, but tomorrow or not tomorrow, but the next day. So if you're on our email list, which you should be, cause you got this message. We're going to send out a free guide of the 99 symptoms of hormone decline. So you can be aware of what they all are and you can maybe educate your doctors about them. Because unfortunately in the U S hormone replacement therapy is only FDA approved for hot flashes and vaginal dryness. All the other symptoms, the other 97 symptoms, they just tell you, well, you're going to get an older that kind of thing. Oh my goodness. Is there a natural form of estrogen? Yes, there is. Um, so there's a few natural forms of estrogen. One is the estrogen that humans make, right? So women's or estrogen, that's natural, of course. Now, little known fact that when hormone replacement therapy first started, they used to use the urine of pregnant women. So actually they used human estrogen. That was the first bioidentical hormone replacement. Now, then they went to like, well, it's too difficult to get women's urine. So someone in some board meeting somewhere was like, I got an idea. Let's use horse urine for us for women. And horses have like 17 different estrogens. None of them are like women's estrogen, but for many, many years and still today, every once in a while, I will see a woman come to our practice and she's on Premier and she's on pregnant Mary urine. And I can't believe doctors are still recommending that because there are FDA approved bioidentical estrogens out there. So there are, if it's bioidentical USP, it'll say estradiol, USP estradiol, USP estriol. That is the only thing it should say. It should not have any words before it or after it. If you're in the UK, it'll say um, O estradiol. So it'll have an O in front of it because you guys say it differently than we do, but that's still the bioidentical. So it has to say USP and it has to say estradiol or estriol. If it says any ethanol, estradiol, ethanol, this conjugated CEE, anything like that, not estrogen and progesterone. It has to say USP progesterone. It can't say medroxy progesterone acetate. It can't say progestin. It can't say any of the other weird things. So those are not, not bioidentical. They're not natural. Now I want to just caveat here. So the definition of natural, it depends how you define it. So bioidentical hormones are derived from natural plants. And so they're either derived from the Mexican or wild yam or from soy. Now our hormones in our practice, we only use organic wild yam. There is a chemical component in both of those plants called diogenin. Now diogenin has the same chemical backbone. So the same chemical layout with a few things extra on it to make it not human the same chemical layout backbone, they call it as human hormones. So it has to be taken into a lab and things have to be extracted off of it. And it becomes estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. You may say, well, there's a lab involved, so it's not natural, but it's derived from nature and nothing's added to it. It's just things taken off of it. So you cannot eat soy or wild yams and get hormones in you. Although Soy and other types of plants can have phytoestrogens. So those are plant estrogens, but they're not human estrogens. Sometimes they can be helpful for women in menopause to help relieve some of the symptoms of menopause, like some of the hot flashes, if you have enough of them. And soy, if it's organic soy or fermented soy for women, it's not bad. So one thing that is really important to note when you're looking at studies or research is that 
The majority of studies out there are done on men, 22 year old college guys that are in great shape. And then they take that information and they put it out to like everybody. So this is like for drugs, for supplements, for everything. And it wasn't until 1993 that they actually mandated that some studies use women. And they still, even animal studies, it's usually male rats. And so much of the research that we have is on men. So when you see that soy is bad or soy causes problems, it actually causes problems for men and not women, but you don't want to do the GMO, sorry. And you don't want to eat like everything soy. So you know how they have like it's like chicken, it's soy, it's soy milk, it's soy this, it's soy that. You want to have soy like edamame, tempeh. You want to have soy in its more natural form, but not so much like everything kind of processed. Because that's still processed. When we talk about processed packaged food, a lot of these products have added vegetable oils and they become inflammatory. So you got to be careful what you're eating. Even if it is plant-based, they can still be bad processed. So Oh, that was kind of a tangent. Michelle, I would use you, but I want a gynecologist in New York City. Can you recommend wheat? Yeah. So if you don't want to do like a telemedicine situation, that's what we offer. So we serve the entire US, Canada, English speaking countries. We have practitioners all over the country and all over the world who can help you. But if you want to see someone locally, I would just interview them like you would interview an employee or like you would kind of like vet someone that you're dating online. You want to ask them, do you prescribe hormone replacement therapy? What percentage of your patients have on hormone replacement therapy? What types of hormone replacement therapy do you prescribe? Do you do bioidentical hormones? And you're going to get some answers there that will tell you whether or not you want to work with that person. If they poo-poo bioidentical hormones, then you probably don't want to work with them because they don't really understand. If they say, yes, we, we recommend FDA approved bioidentical hormones. Perfect. And then just make sure they test hormones too, because Standard of care in the United States is that it's kind of, here's like the unfair thing with men versus women too. So standard of care, if a man who's in his fifties walks into his doctor's office and says, I'm feeling a little off, you know, I just feel like tired. I feel not myself. I'm having trouble putting on muscle. First thing the doctor does, like, let's test those testosterone levels. And then if the test comes back low, he's prescribed testosterone. And then he's retested every four months or so to make sure his levels are maintained. If a woman goes into her doctor's office, 55 years old, goes into her doctor's office, complains that she's feeling tired, she's having hot flashes, you know, she can't sleep, she's not interested in sex anymore, she's gaining weight, all the same things, feeling off, feeling a little down, she's going to get offered an antidepressant and she's going to be told that hormones are not necessary and that she doesn't need them. That's just part of getting older. Total double standard. But there are a lot of doctors who do understand the importance of testing hormones because just because you're in menopause or just because you're in perimenopause doesn't mean that your hormones are all low. You might have higher estrogen and low progesterone. You might have high testosterone and low estrogen and progesterone. So it's always a good idea to test. And so it's always a good idea. Um, and that brings me to another question that came up. And it was like, how do I know if I'm in menopause? Menopause is defined as a cessation of your menstrual periods for 12 months. So once you've gone 12 months without a period, that is a good indicator that you're in menopause, especially if you also have some of the symptoms of menopause. Now, there are other situations in life that would create that situation where you go 12 months without a period. So if you have low body weight as a young woman, female athlete triad, where they lose their period, amenorrhea, if you're on certain forms of birth control that kind of stop your period, then that could be another reason why you went 12 months without your period. In this case, I'd recommend getting an FSH test. So follicle stimulating hormone. If you have a follicle stimulating hormone test on two or more occasions where it's over 35, you're considered in menopause. And then if you also haven't had your period, if you're not on like a hormone replacement or something like that, or have had a hysterectomy where your ovaries were removed. Now, if you had a hysterectomy where your ovaries were removed, that date that you had both your ovaries removed, that is your date that you go into menopause. And if you had one ovary removed and then you had to go back to get the other ovary removed, your date when you went into menopause is the date you had that second ovary removed. So hopefully that makes sense. So you, you are officially 
menopausal on that 12 month anniversary of your last period. When we touch your hormones, we're going to see your hormones are low. You'll be in the menopause range, which really means your hormones are almost non-existent, but they're not zero. On a blood test, you're going to see estrogen levels between zero and 20. For women who are in menopause, that's really nothing. Someone who's cycling is going to be up to 400. So it's, it's very, very minimal to see. Give us a good regimen or protocol for the best or proper HRT for pre-menopausal and menopausal women. Are you asking for dosing? Because it's going to be different for everybody. I recommend that in my practice, we give all women who are deficient in estrogen and progesterone, we give them estrogen and progesterone in some practices. Some doctors will say, well, you don't need progesterone because you've had a hysterectomy and you don't need progesterone to protect your uterus. But progesterone, I talked before about it's helpful for anxiety. It's helpful for sleep. It's helpful for your brain. It does have a component in helping your bones. It helps your digestion. So many different things that progesterone does that are not just protecting your uterus. We like to test your hormones and personalize it to you, but we also, inside our Healthy Hormone Club, we have something called the Healthy Hormone Academy, which we just are opening up on November 1st. So if, if you're in the Healthy Hormone Club, our hormone replacement program, you get this for free. And it's it's diet advice, it's workouts, it's tips for better sleep, it's how to detox your body. We do castor oil packs and dry brushing and digestion help and pelvic floor help. And it's a holistic program is what I'm trying to say is it's not just health after menopause, life after 50 is not just putting hormones in your body. It's also all the other things that we have to do. So definitely a healthy lifestyle is going to help your hormones work better for sure. What about dry skin, especially dry vulva? It's super painful. Yes. Gin is a hydrating hormone. It hydrates our vaginal tissues. It hydrates our skin. It hydrates our joints and it hydrates our blood vessels. So when estrogen drops, your blood vessels become rigid and they're more likely to have damage, which raises your cholesterol. Estrogen is important for collagen and elastin in our skin and also the hydration of our skin. So that's why once you get older, you don't, your skin doesn't bounce back as much. Like when you bounce on your cheek, when Paxi was in here, it could have been like, boom, 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 and the skin pops right back. And when you lose estrogen, that, that matrix, that collagen and elastin on your skin, that, that declines deeply. So when women hit menopause, that first three to five years in menopause, your collagen decreases by 30%, 30%. That is huge. And then it kind of rapidly decreases from there. We have a decline every year after 30, but it just boom goes down. And then the hydration goes with it. Vaginal estrogen in a moisturizer. We, I just formulated, it's right here. So this does not have a label on it because this is a sample, but I am releasing vaginal moisturizers that have estrogen and then also DHEA. The DHEA is another one that's hydrating and helpful for helping the integrity of your vaginal tissue. So why is it painful? Well, one, it's the dryness, right? So super dry, itchy. When you have dryness, it changes the microbiome in your vagina and you can have more less protection. It changes the pH. So you're more likely to have like infections, UTIs, but also the vaginal wall, when it has a lot of blood flow and it's when it's healthy, it flush. It's like both sides of your vagina, those vaginal walls, they're like, it's like a thick plush, like laying on a comforter. And then when the estrogen goes, goes away, the blood flow decreases and it just gets like sleeping on a sheet instead of a comforter. So you have this nice like pillow top mattress or you're sleeping on the hardwood floor. And that's kind of what it's like when your estrogen goes away, you don't have that plushness. So of course, if you're going to have intercourse, oh my God, it's painful. Not only because it's the dryness, which you can use a lubricant, but the walls are now so thin and so atrophied that you actually are not having that comfort sensation. And it can be very, very painful. And even if you're not having intercourse, the dryness and the atrophy can make it uncomfortable. I have women who tell me that they can't even wear underwear anymore because the, the friction is very uncomfortable or they, they can't go for a hike. And so that's why I actually created these hormones, the top of the vaginal moisturizers. And the nice thing about these is that even if you are not wanting to use hormone replacement because of any reason, I just kind of explained why estrogen is not positive to cancer, but maybe you, you still want to be in that camp where you think it's not right for you or, or you just for any reason you don't want to do it. Maybe you currently have cancer. Maybe you're on estrogen blocking medication and you don't want to put more, more estrogen in. 
these stay local to the vaginal tissue. So we're, we're going to be able to offer these outside of the hormone club. I'm showing you these. I shouldn't do this because it doesn't have labels on it. And these aren't even the bottles they're coming in, but they, this is my samples from the, from the lab. So I just want to let you know those are coming. So definitely look out for that. We're calling it glow below. So glow below with estrogen and glow below with DHEA. The one of our health coaches came up with that name and I thought it was awesome. Oh, hello, Mary Beth. Welcome to the Healthy Hormone Club. So excited to see you. We are excited. So how it works in case I've got a couple of people asking how it works. So we offer hormone replacement therapy and coaching and support holistically to pretty much all English speaking countries. If we're able to ship you a test kit, then they will, will serve you. What happens is you fill out a medical intake form, you fill out a few forms, and then we review those. And then we send you a hormone test kit. They can either be saliva testing or dry blood spot testing. So a dry blood spot is capillary blood. Saliva is your free hormones that give us a good idea of where your hormones are at or gives us exactly where your hormones are at. And that will tell us where our starting point is. And when you do this test, you're also going to fill out a symptom questionnaire. This is going to ask you symptoms about symptoms, the severity of symptoms of estrogen deficiency, estrogen excess, progesterone deficiency, high and low testosterone. It's going to look at high and low cortisol, high and low thyroid and metabolic syndrome. And we're going to look at all of that as a big picture. You'll send the test kit, your sample to the lab. The lab will get us back those results. And then you'll meet with a hormone specialist. I have a team of elite hormone specialists that are amazing, trained by me. We meet every week. We do more training. We are constantly talking about our, our cases. And so we are a collaborative team and we will meet with them. They'll go over your test results, go over your symptoms and create a protocol for you. And then we ship your hormones out. Your hormones are automatically replenished. We retest you every four months. You have access to the Healthy Hormone Academy, which Mary Beth, if you don't have access yet, it was starting on November 1st. And you'll be able to go through the modules, learn about nutrition, learn about exercise, learn about sleep learn about stress reduction, pelvic floor therapy, and you have unlimited support. So we have a whole team, a whole support staff who are just wanting to help your hormones. And so we, we love what we do. Uh, we're really excited about it and it's very affordable. Right now it's on sale for the month. So definitely check it out. And you can go to healthyhormoneclub.com if you want to check out the Healthy Hormone Club, like the details. Let's see, when you say topical application of hormones, can that topical application be anywhere? I've heard other menopause sum summits and that it should be intravaginal or on the vulva. So vaginal hormone therapy can be the, your vagina is the canal. So that is inserted up into the vaginal canal. Vulva, you can have external hormone replacement that you just, you apply with your fingers and you put it over the vulva. And if you kind of like sweep it over, it'll get a little into the vaginal canal. So there's that that does not go systemic. So that's not going to help you with your bone health, your brain health, protection from heart disease, all the, the symptoms that you think about besides the vaginal symptoms. So it's going to help with the vaginal symptoms. Topical hormones are where you apply them to your, your, your areas of skin that don't have hair follicles. So your forearms, your inner thighs, behind your knee, lower abdomen, places like that. Sometimes we'll do a slow release, which will be like applied to the butt or the outer thigh. So it depends on the person and the situation. But yeah, topical hormones are going transdermal. It's like transdermal. So it's going into the skin, into the bloodstream. Vaginal hormones are going, staying in the vaginal mucosa. So hopefully that's helpful. No uterus, but still have ovaries. My only symptoms so far is hot flashes. What would be a good protocol? So I would, I would, if it was me personally, I, the sooner you start in hormone replacement therapy, the better. So you might just be on a lower dose because you don't have a lot of symptoms and just keeping your, your hormones stable. So you don't have increased risk of diabetes, heart disease, bone loss, all those things, cognitive decline. And you can prevent the, the vaginal dryness is going to come. The vaginal atrophy is going to come. The blood vessel rigidity, that's going to come. It's all coming down the line. So you can kind of prevent that from happening. Can natural HRT cause you to harm if you have mixed cog connective tissue damage with no symptoms? I have to look at your profile specifically, but that's why we have everyone follow a medical intake form and we'll look and advise you whether you can or cannot do hormone replacement therapy, but not, I'd have to, that the name of that disease, mixed connective tissue disease, that can, there's different variations of that. So I'd have to see what's going on with you in order to give you 
a positive answer. And everything I say on these Q and A's should not be construed as medical advice. This is just answering questions because I'm a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. Please check with your own practitioner before you know making a decision of what to do. Are progestins better than nothing at all? Actually, not. They will give you some symptom relief, but they, they are dangerous. So there's no reason why you can't use natural progesterone. It's available in low dose over the counter in most areas. So there's no reason why anyone should be using a synthetic progestin. It's not, it's just dangerous and there's no reason for it. Let's see, I'm losing my hair only very recently. Awful. Hair becomes super fine. It's strange. I've never read that. My hair, hair was super fine. Looks like pet hair. Oh no. One of the most common reasons for hair loss is the discrepancy between the testosterone level and the DHEA and testosterone level and the estrogen and progesterone. So when we hit menopause, our estrogen and progesterone nose dies, but our testosterone levels stay pretty, pretty stable for quite some time. And so when you have the higher level of testosterone ratio to estrogen and progesterone, then that causes that hair loss, that male pattern baldness. It can cause facial hair, it can cause aggression, it can cause weight gain around the midsection. And so replacing your estrogen and progesterone, super helpful. Now, the other thing I have to kind of say though, because I don't want to lead you down the wrong path is there's also a genetic reason for hair loss. So you, you were, our hair follicles are genetically programmed. And so if other women in your family have had hair loss around your age, it might actually not be hormonal. However, if you're familiar with pregnant women and how lush and shiny their hair gets during pregnancy, that glow, that's the increased hormones. So estrogen and progesterone can definitely help with thickness, help with some hair regrowth. I actually have a whole video on YouTube about hair loss and hormones. Let's see. I picked up quite a bit of weight before I checked on my hormone imbalances. Will weight come down now that I've started HRT? It will. So it'll be easier for you to lose weight than, than if you weren't on hormones. It does take a while for you to lose the weight and you will have to, you know, do some exercise. So it doesn't have to be any specific type of exercise, but I would recommend resistance training and some type of cardiovascular exercise. We're humans. Humans are meant to move. We're not supposed to be sedentary, but yes, it'll be much easier to lose the weight on HRT versus off HRT. We just want to make sure you're testing your hormones and your balance because excessive estrogen or excessive hormones that can cause you to hold on to weight. So you want to be in the optimal range. You don't want excessive levels of hormones, especially excessive testosterone. That's another reason why I don't love the pellets because they're so high dose. And almost every woman who comes to me now, younger women, if you're under 35, a lot of women under 35 are starting to get hormone replacement because that generation, they're all getting Botox, they're all getting all kinds of stuff. They're getting all these procedures done because they don't want to grow up. And so these women who are younger, they're getting testosterone pellets put in and they generally don't have a lot of issues because their estrogen and progesterone are still pretty high. But as older women who are over 45, when we get that high test testosterone, sometimes the first pellet, the first time you feel pretty okay. And then usually about a third or fourth time that you have to get it inserted. So usually after a year, you start putting on the weight. And so that's another reason why I don't love it. Now, this is not absolutely set in stone has to happen to everybody, but I'm talking about the majority of people. Okay, I'm going to go back to the Q and A because I was, I was answering the chat here and I'll go back to that, but I know you guys have a lot of questions in the Q and A. So let's see, I it was right there. Okay, I answered that one. At what age should a woman stop bioidentical hormones? Great question. There is no upper age limit. So if you are doing well, you're feeling good and your hormone levels are in the optimal range that your practitioner is testing, you can stay on the hormones for the rest of your life. And that's what I plan to do. Because I don't, because once you stop your hormones, then all the symptoms of hormone deficiency are going to come back. And so there's no reason why, if you are in ideal ranges, that you have to stop your hormones. You don't have to. So there's no upper age limit. And there used to be, there used to be a time limit. So it used to be, and this came out of that women's health initiative study. So women should only be on hormones at the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time. Do you know why they said that? Because they were giving you synthetic hormones that are bad for you and they're dangerous for your body. But when you're giving yourself bioidentical hormones that are actually health promoting, there, there's very little or no side effects of topical 
bioidentical hormones when dosed appropriately and monitored and a healthy lifestyle is adopted. And so there's no reason you have a patch, you have oral, oral progesterone, it's not so bad as long as it is bioidentical and the patch is fine. You might want to ask your practitioner if you can get some estriol because estriol is very protective. It's great, but I think you're fine. My doctor prescribed progesterone 100 milligrams a day. Is there a natural alternative? It, your progesterone might be natural. Ask your pharmacist. If you don't trust your doctor, ask your pharmacist. Pharmacists are great. I just had a woman who she joined a healthy hormone club. She was so excited to balance her hormones. And then like two weeks later, she called and she's like, I need to stop the program. I'm like, what happened? You were so excited. My doctor said the hormones are going to cause cancer. And I'm like, oh my God, no, I'll get a second opinion. So she went to another doctor and that doctor said, yes, the hormones are going to cause cancer. I'm like, oh my God, that these, these doctors probably don't have any education. So I'm like, so she, I'm like, still try to ask someone else. So she asked her pharmacist and her pharmacist have all the research. And he's like, no, you're right. You're totally fine. The hormones are not going to cause cancer. And he had the same research I was just talking about earlier. Ask your pharmacist if your progesterone is bioidentical and you might be fine. If you prefer to take topical hormones because topical hormones don't have to go through the digestive system in the liver. So it's less stress on your liver, especially if any liver toxicity or any issues with fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver, or any digestive issues, you might want to go to topical and that's completely fine, but there, you're probably okay. Let's see. I'm sorry. I'm late during. Did you already adjust, adjust why someone way past menopause has hot flashes or other hormonal effects? It's actually not uncommon. It's just not talked about a lot that you can have menopause symptoms for 20, 30, 40 years. I have a woman who's 89 in my practice and she was having hot flashes up until this year, up until we started working with her. And it wasn't just hormones. We actually had to make some dietary changes. We had to make some lifestyle changes. So we had to do some stress reduction. And so it's not just hormones, but hormones do play a big part in it. Is it true that hard workouts can work against postmenopausal body to lose weight? Okay, one of the weight reasons why we gain weight is cortisol, right? So this is true for digestion too. So when we have, when estrogen declines, cortisol kind of increases a little bit, our ability to handle stress decreases. And so if you're beating yourself up all the time at the gym and you're causing a lot of stress on your body, and this is true for any age, it can cause some high cortisol and it might make you hold on to your weight. The same thing with extreme dieting. If you extreme diet, you probably aren't going to lose weight as well. I recommend for workouts, I recommend doing strength training, prioritize your strength training. So prioritize lifting heavy weights and then also walking or doing some type of steady state, like going for a walk around the block for 10 minutes at a time, three times a day, going for a 30 minute walk outside walking on the treadmill while you kind of check your phone messages, getting some movement in your day, doing yoga, dancing, swimming, anything that you enjoy, but you don't have to beat yourself up. You don't have to do like, I used to do CrossFit. I, I love CrossFit actually. And doing that a few times a week is great. And then having some restorative exercise too. So we're working on flexibility, uh, maybe having a yoga Tai Chi kind of day where it's more relaxing and just moving and flowing. And some type of balance work is great too, because as we get older, our balance is really important. So incorporating that either into your strength training or into your restorative work, things like yoga, and then having like some cardio in there. And I think when I say cardio, I'm not talking about running a marathon. I'm talking about just moving. Like I, uh, if I can, if something is that I usually go to is like within like a half a mile, I don't even get in my car. I just walk. Like I walk to the gym because a half mile away. There's a little store down the street that sometimes I need like just little odds and ends and I'll just walk there. I don't know why, like I'm not going to get in the car. It's like right there. So just being active in your day, cleaning your house and you know, whatever, dance, turn on a song and dance to it and get your body moving. Our bodies are designed to move. It helps with our circulation. It helps with our blood flow, helps with our digestion, helps with our elimination, all that stuff. Super important. What do you mean by dry brushing? You know, so dry brushing is where you take literally, let me grab it. So you take, you take a brush like this or like this. So they come with the handle, it's not a handle and you literally brush your skin. So what it does is it moves your lymphatic. So your lymphatic system is right under your skin and that's where all your fluid is. Helps flush your body and it helps actually with immune health. So many things can help. So I'm going to be doing a video on that very shortly. Hopefully that's helpful. But yeah, dry brushing, you can pick these up like anywhere, like Target, but, or you can order on Amazon. There's, this one has like 
a handle on the back. The other one has a, a longer handle so you can get like your back. There's a specific way to do it. You can Google it. You can Google dry brushing, but I'll be making a video on that super soon. Let's see. Do you have any suggestions about weight loss for postmenopausal when all the traditional ways have failed? I actually have a whole video on that on my YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. But things I was just talking about, the exercise, eating more protein. So eating one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. How you can decide that is that hundred pounds is going to be hundred grams of protein. And every five pounds over is going to be an extra gram. So every inch over five feet is going to be five pounds. So if you are, are five foot five, you're going to be 125 pounds and that'll be 125 grams of protein. And if you're five foot two, that's 110 pounds or 110 grams of protein. I'm not saying you should be that weight. That depends on like your build and your, your frame and how much muscle you have. So I'm not saying that's your ideal weight, but what I'm saying is that's how much protein you should have. Protein helps to build muscle. It helps to build bone, but also pro when you eat protein, you actually burn calories just digesting protein about 30% of the total calories you eat. So if you eat hundred calories of protein, you burn 30 of it, just digesting it, just eating it. You only get 70 calories net. So definitely focus on protein, vegetables, healthy fats in that order, and then get some weight training. Cause when you weight train and you build muscle, muscle burns calories just sitting around. So when you have a pound of muscle that burns like another, I don't know, 100 calories per day, at least maybe 200 calories a day. So if you put on five pounds of muscle, you're going to be burning a lot more calories per day. So you can still eat the same amount, but you'll weigh less. So hopefully that makes sense. I have a whole video on this, so I don't want to go into too much detail because I've talked about it earlier. How will we keep ourselves young if proper HRT is not available in my place? Okay. It looks like you are overseas. I'm not really sure where you live but HRT can be available. Otherwise, all of the lifestyle stuff, I wrote a whole book and I'll send my book out with anyone who won one of the prizes that we're shipping to you, but it's called The Hormone Harmony Over 35. If you go to our website, glownaturalwellness.com, there'll be, and you go to leave, <laughs> it'll pop up that if you want a free copy of the book, it'll be a digital copy. But in that book, I give you all of the non-hormonal ways to keep yourself healthy and young and vibrant for a very long time. So it's a whole book about diet, exercise, stress reduction, supplementation, the different activities and, and practices you can do. There's a whole 21 day hormone healing meal plan in there. I talk about the dry brushing in there. I talk about different practices you can do like detox baths and all kinds of wonderful things. And then also just follow my YouTube channel, Fix Hormones with Dr. Michelle. Lots of great information on there that are not hormones. Let's see, I'm going to have a hysterectomy in December, uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes removed, keeping the ovaries. What can I do to protect my bones and my brain? Well, the good news is if you're keeping your ovaries, you'll still make estrogen and progesterone until you hit menopause. And then you'll want to protect your bones and your brain. I would definitely test your hormones within about four months after hysterectomy. I don't know how old you are, but test your hormones then and see if you're below the optimal. And then at that time, you might want to start supplementing with some hormone replacement therapy, some low dose. And then you'll want to test every six to 12 months because when you have that partial hysterectomy, when you have a lot of your parts removed, it can cause a decrease in your hormones quicker. So it can cause you to go into menopause sooner than you would have without having that surgery. So definitely keep up on it so that you don't have that bone loss. You don't have that brain fog, the skin collagen loss and all the other things. Definitely. What do you recommend for hot flashes other than estrogen? There's a lot of things. So I'll make, I'll make sure you optimize your omega threes, like fish oil, fatty fish, things like that. Make sure you optimize your vitamin D levels so you can get a vitamin D test. You should be between 60 and 90 on the scale here in the US, a lot of labs will say between 20 and 60 is normal, too low. So optimize your vitamin D, reduce things like alcohol, spicy foods, caffeine, and processed foods, because that will help those a lot of those are triggers for hot flashes. Things like that can be helpful. Definitely run a fan at night, dress in layers. I mean, those are all things that are just going to make you feel more comfortable, but most people know about those. So those are some of the things you can do for some people, phytoestrogens. So in consuming some phytoestrogens in the diet, like plant estrogens, things like 
soy, things like flaxseed. Sometimes those can help as well. There's also some herbs like black cohosh is one. They're not well researched or the research that's there is doesn't really show any benefit. So I can't really, really recommend them as, as a, a way to help hot flashes, but there's some anecdotal evidence that for women, they say that it does help their hot flashes. You might try that, but estrogen is probably estrogen and progesterone are probably the best things for hot flashes. Let's see. Estrogen and progesterone is low due to hysterectomy and being over 70, but still some testosterone and seeing some Side hair thinning, more hair forming on chin. Yeah, so that's because your your androgens are dominant now. You're the dominant hormone is your androgens. Let's see which hormonal therapy will treat all of this. Estrogen and progesterone replacement definitely would help. Let's see, sex hormone binding globulin is 38, testosterone is 3.1, DHA went from 379 to 183. My gynecologist uses pellets. My primary care is on the fence about bioidentical hormones. I noticed my art, my prescription plan covers gels for estrogen and testosterone, but nothing yet. See if you can find another practitioner. Um, that would probably be my advice. And if you can't, you can check out the Healthy Hormone Club. We do not take insurance. We do take SHA and FHA cards. You can get that discount there, but it's very affordable. But just ask for another, just keep pressing. So yeah, I do, I just, I want that estrogen gel. Can you please give it to me? <laughs> just keep asking for it and go to another doctor if you have to. I'm on a Stalis 20, 50, 50 patch. I had rectal cancer last year and went into menopause immediately. Is this patch okay? I believe it is. I don't know off the top of my head because I, I'm not familiar with that brand, but you can look it up and see if it contains estradiol, USP estradiol. And then I'm not sure what the other 50 is. Maybe it's progesterone or maybe it's testosterone. So you can look. The patches are usually pretty safe though. Topical transdermal delivery. I am a fan of patches. Uh, for a DES, that's most menopausal female. That's way to balance hormones. So DES is a super duper potent, super high dose hormonal agent that was given to women who are pregnant to prevent miscarriage or it's supposed to be helpful that it turned out being a nightmare and offspring of these women and even their offspring have a lot of reproductive issues. And so you might want to look into hormone replacement therapy to help balance you out because you're going to have more issues than, than most other women. Let's see, is it too late for my 74 year old mother in law to start bioidentical hormone replacement? Depending on her health profile, she can definitely be a candidate. I would have her you know, consult with somebody like myself or fill out one of our questionnaires, and she can definitely be a candidate. There's no upper age limit. There's just some people that might want to focus on some other things first. Or you know, topical bioidentical hormones have very few side effects of any. The only downside of being over 75 is that you may not get as much benefit. You'll still get some benefits, but you won't get, you'll get less benefit than someone who's in their forties because a lot of your hormone receptors may take a while to take the hormones. They might be like sleeping and they're dormant in other words. So you're going to get, still get some benefit. She may not get as much benefit as a younger person. However, there's not really any downside. So there's no real negative issue. Oral hormones and synthetic hormones, those can cause issues with heart issues and other problems down the line. Let's see, I had a hysterectomy and no estrogen HRT seems to work. What can be causing that? I'm not sure if you had your ovaries removed and I'm not sure what you've tried as far as HRT. You might need more than estrogen. You might need estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone or estrogen, progesterone, and DHEA. So you might need other things. You also might have issue with your thyroid or adrenals. There might be other things going on. So I would have to look at more, but definitely press with your practitioner based on your symptoms and see. But definitely download my book, Hormone Harmony Over 35. You can go to our website, grab it, and it'll give you some ideas. There's a little quiz in there that tells you like what your symptoms are, which imbalance your symptoms are linked to. So that can help. Info on thyroids. I will be making a whole video on thyroid. There's some questions on that, but I'm not sure what your specific question is. The women who have had estrogen positive breast cancer are convinced they need to take estrogen or hormone suppression therapy, otherwise known as aromatase inhibitors. This would appear to be the wrong approach. I mean, it's misunderstanding some. So I can't give you medical advice per se. So I have to tell you to like work with your local practitioner, but it's not always the case. Women who are not currently 
have women who are at, don't currently have active cancer can benefit from hormone, hormone replacement therapy because it actually reduces the rate of their recurrence. It increases their ability to recover from cancer should they get it again, and it's protective against not only breast cancer, but colon cancer, all types of other cancers. So that's my take on it, but I, I can't give medical advice in this format. Let's see, I have a multitude of friends that have pellets. This typical typically is a doctor's preference in respect of... So pellet therapy is something that I can go and take a weekend course where I go and they show me how to insert the pellet. And I don't have to know anything else about hormones. And most doctors or med spa, like places that you go get Botox, they do pellets too. They usually don't know much about hormones and they give everyone pretty much the same amount of hormones. It's a big, it's a big moneymaker. So it's very low cost for doctors to get the pellets and it's, they make a huge profit on them. So that's usually why doctors like to do it. It doesn't require, there's no changes to doses. So it's not like their patients are going to call and be like, Hey, can we change my dose? Cause it's like, you come in, we give you the pellet, you're gone. And then next time you come in, if you have issues, we might change which pellet we give you. But yeah, no, I'm most well-versed, most knowledgeable practitioners who have gone to a lot of advanced training do not offer pellets. It's the practitioners that don't have a lot of training, generally speaking. I'm sure there's some very well-educated practitioners that do, that do pellets, but it's just what I see. And when I go to things like the American Academy of Anti-Aging Conferences, and there's doctors who go, they, they just, all they do, like myself, is take more continuing education on hormones and none of the doctors there usually like pellets. So that's just my take on it. See, I'm full of menopause and I have not had a period in well over a year. Okay. Is it too late for me to start hormone? No, 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 no. Um, you're at the perfect time. Ideally, like if there was no, there money wasn't an object and there was no like other like barriers. I would say like when women are in their thirties, as soon as their hormones start to kind of decline, give them a little tiny bit of hormones to keep them optimal. That would be the most ideal, but you just went into menopause. Like you're just one year. That's really perfect. Cause you're, you're just starting the decline. You haven't lost all your collagen yet. You haven't lost all your bone yet. Your blood vessels are still pliable. You probably don't have really harsh vaginal dryness yet. So you're probably just before you start to really go downhill, I think you're at the best time right now to do it. The best time is always like, there, there's that old proverb that says like the, the best time to do something was 10 years ago, but the second best time is right now, right? Cause you can't go 10 years ago. Are IUDs a concern for causing breast cancer since they are synthetic? Yeah, it's not only breast cancer, it's more, um, they, they are synthetic projections. So it's more like stroke, heart attack, things like that. Not to mention that they are disrupting hormones. So when you're on an IUD, you're doing the opposite of hormone replacement therapy. You're actually disrupting your hormones intentionally for birth control, which it's kind of, it's a touchy subject because I'm all about like women, women's empowerment and women being able to like have control of their bodies. And if you choose to use birth control, just know that you're kind of doing the opposite of balancing your hormones, but I understand if you don't want to have a baby and you know, it's, it's an option for you and you could still do some hormone replacement. You're not going to get your hormones completely balanced because you're purposefully imbalancing your hormones, but it's usually a synthetic progestin. I'm personally not a fan of any synthetic hormones going in the body, but it's a, it's something that you have to kind of weigh the benefits versus the risks. So I don't want to tell you not to do it, <laughs> but you have to make that decision for yourself. Do you test thyroids along with and treat along with BHRT? Yes, we do. So we, we test so many, pretty much everything that you can test, we can test in our practice. Our Healthy Hormone Club includes just hormone testing. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but we can add on thyroid. We can add on cholesterol, vitamin D, you know, all adrenals, all types of things. So yes, we can test thyroid, but we don't, we don't include that in that program. So outside that program. And then I, I do like thyroid glandulars better than something like Synthroid. The Synthroid, like the synthetic thyroid hormone is not the same. It's not, there's not the same dangers associated with the synthetic 
estrogen and progesterone because synthetic thyroid hormone is not just for women, it's for men and women. So that they actually, it is pretty much similar to what we have in our body. And then the natural thyroid hormone, that's actually from animals that were, they take like bovine or porcine. So pig or, or cow uh, thyroid, and they, they grind it up and they encapsulate it. That's what the natural, the glandular thyroid. So that has a little bit of T3 and T4 and a little bit of T2 in the glandular is where the synthetic is just T4, which is the, the most abundant thyroid hormone that we make, but it's not the active one. So you still have to make that conversion, but this is a topic for a whole nother conversation about thyroid. So I will make a video about thyroid. Let's see. Can hormone replacement help with improving sleep for someone with, help with fibromyalgia? Yes. And it can actually help fibromyalgia symptoms as well. So a lot of times women who get on hormone replacement, they notice their fibromyalgia is very much improved because it helps with all types of aches and pains. And so definitely, but certainly help with sleep. Yes, for sure. Can you describe the process of supporting those who are in your balancing healthy hormone club? Do you mean like how you get support? You can reach out to any of our hormone specialists at any time, but we, we get, we provide hormones, we provide coaching, we provide testing, and I, I'm not sure what you mean by the process of supporting, but you can reach out, you can get on calls with our hormone specialist if you have an issue or concern regarding your hormones, or if a new symptom pops up, or you don't understand your tests, or anything like that, you can definitely reach out to us. We'll jump on a call after you via text or email. So yeah, we're so a lot of support. We're a big family over there. <laughs> Is there a way to ID practitioners in my area? I have an MP right now and on compounded BHRT, numbers look good, but all my symptoms, all point is still being estrogen dominant. Well, I would start with asking your current practitioner to test your hormones. That's probably the easiest. You don't need to leave her. I would just definitely test your hormones first. I do see gynecologists, endocrinologists, naturopaths, or any particular field. It's hard to say because none of them, including myself, I mean, we get, we do get, not Catholic doctors do get education on all of the body systems. So we do get education on the reproductive system, but, and there is some information on menopause and perimenopause, but not to the extent in like hormone replacement therapy, although there is electives. So I did get to take elective courses on these things. And then after school, there's additional education. So you can be an endocrinologist, you can be a gynecologist, you can be a naturopathic physician, and you might not have taken any education on hormone replacement therapy for menopause. So you just have to reach out to them. Like I said before, to the other person, interview them, ask what they prescribe. Do you prescribe bioidentical hormones? Do you use synthetic hormones? Do you, do you let us decide what we want? Do you do testing? All of those things. So I definitely recommend that. And yeah, it's not always covered by insurance. It depends on your insurance plan. And sometimes insurance will only cover the synthetics or the oral hormones. What about using Primarin vaginally and bioidentical topically? Why can't you just use bioidentical hormones vaginally too? Um, it's probably less dangerous because it's going to stay local to your vaginal tissue, but I have to argue that bioidentical estrogen will work better in the human body than horse estrogen. So yeah, I mean, if you're getting prescribed bioidentical topical hormones, why would they not prescribe you bioidentical vaginal hormones? There's so many out there. So yeah, I would just ask for that. Let's see, I'm getting sore joints. Should I increase estrogen or could it be low testosterone as well? I would recommend testing. Tests don't guess. Sometimes symptoms can overlap. So there can be a symptom that is associated with low testosterone, low estrogen, and low progesterone, or low cortisol or low thyroid. So hormones are not something that you want. They're very Goldilocks. So you don't want to just increase hormones here and then backfire, and then it takes your body a while to kind of come back from that. I would definitely test your hormones and see where you're at. I don't know much about your program. Is it covered by insurance? No, we do not take insurance. We are fully, nothing that we do in our practice is insurance-based because if it was, then we would only be able to prescribe hormones for hot flashes and vaginal dryness. And we would not be able to recommend hormones for all these other issues because that is what the FDA approves hormones for. And so we would be 
bound and, and have to only do things a certain way. And I believe women should have better. We do keep our cost of our program very, very low because they wouldn't cover our testing anyway, because the medical community doesn't believe that women's hormones should be tested. And they think that we're too confusing and that all women are the same. And so that, that's why we don't take insurance, but right now, for instance, for the entire year, for all of your hormones, your consultations, your support, the shipping of your hormones, your hormone testing every four months, all of that for the whole year is $1,399, including everything, or you can break it up into monthly payments for $139 a month. So it's super inexpensive probably less than your copay. You know, even if you go to like a consultation with a local doctor, a lot of times they'll charge you like a few hundred dollars. Just talk about whether or not you need hormones and then they'll charge you a couple hundred dollars for a test and then they'll charge you for the visit and then you'll pay for your prescriptions. And so it adds up, it can be expensive. How do you convince regular PCPs to run the right hormone panels? It's really hard to because again, insurance is like, but you can, if you have like a, I have to say in- <laughs> Younger doctors seem to be more open. If you go to a DO, osteopathic doctor, they tend to be more functional minded or you can see a functional medicine doctor. Sometimes they'll let you run the right hormones, but you can actually, you don't need to wait for a doctor. We offer our hormone tests online. If you go to our website and you go to shop and then you go to the laboratory tests down at the bottom, there's a hormone test called the hormone trio. You can test your estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. It's not that expensive and you can go from there. So you don't need to wait for a doctor to allow you to test your hormones. You can do it yourself. And, and then some people say, I mean, I know people say like they want their insurance to cover it, but we go out and we buy, you know, a dinner at the restaurant and insurance doesn't cover that. And then we go and buy Lululemon leggings and, you know, like all the things that we do for ourselves, we don't wait for someone to cover it for us. Insurance is actually designed to be there for catastrophes. So just like your house insurance is there, if your house burns down or gets flooded, but if you need to like do some repairs in your house, your house insurance doesn't cover that. Or if you want to paint the walls because you want it to look nicer, your house insurance doesn't cover that. If you have to have someone come clean the house, your house insurance doesn't cover it. If you just feel like getting new floors, your house insurance doesn't cover that. Just like your body, like your health insurance doesn't cover you from like like dying, you know, or getting hit by a car or it's waiting for you to get sick. And then once you have diabetes, they'll pay for your diabetic medication, but they're not going to pay for you to eat organic food. You have to just take it into your own hands and, and be willing to invest in yourself now. So you're not paying for it later, basically. See, this question is a little bit long. I might answer this one afterwards because it's so long. I don't want to wait for it. So I'm going to skim it. It's about Hashimoto's. So let's see. I have Hashimoto's. I've also had colon cancer. Because of Hashimoto's, I also developed high blood pressure and arrhythmia. Beginning this year, I had a breast reduction done. The mammography was clean. They cut tissues, sent to the lab found four centimeter cancerous cells in one gland. Let's see. I ordered hormone testing because I would like to start having HRT. I still have aching joints and hair loss, especially at the top of my scalp, just like men. Because of my Hashimoto's, I have difficulty releasing weight. I would love to have a consultation after my test. I paid for this option. Perfect. I would love to know what you would have say about my situation. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune thyroid condition where you have antibodies in your, your body that can attack your thyroid and cause you to have hypo or low thyroid symptoms. I don't know if you are on any thyroid medication or any treatment, but Hashimoto's is actually not actually a thyroid problem. It's more of an immune problem. So healing the gut is going to be really important for you to kind of bring down those antibodies. Megaspore probiotic, it's my favorite probiotic. It's the one I use, have used for over 10 years for myself, but also for my son, my whole family. And in my practice, we always recommend it. There's actually some research coming out in about three months where taking a Megaspore probiotic on a daily basis to actually reduce your Hashimoto's antibodies actually really help mine. Also, there's other things like systemic enzymes that you can take to reduce your antibodies. 
which is great. So definitely hair loss could be from thyroid. So that's one of the things. And also difficulty releasing weight could be from thyroid too. But I would definitely look at the big picture. When you do your test, you're, you're going to have those questions that we ask you. And we're going to be able to see based on your test results and based on your symptoms, where your dysfunction likely is. So it can definitely help, uh, help support your thyroid too. So estrogen and progesterone are necessary for proper thyroid function. So they support each other, but you don't want excess of these hormones because then it can hurt your thyroid. So you need to have balance of all of your system, symptom, all of your endocrine organ organs, basically in the entire system and actually really help to support each other. So adrenals, thyroid, ovaries, so estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, thyroid hormone, they all work together. They all, when one's high, it surpasses another one. When they're all balanced, they're happy. So hopefully that's helpful. Let's see. I developed facial hair about 18 months ago, then started transdermal bioidentical hormones. I still get some and slightly less, but I'm losing hair a lot. I'm 76. There's some one or two hairs on your chin that could be genetic. Women who are from Mediterranean countries tend to have more hair. There's more hairy than other women. It can, now, the hairs that you already had growing. So if you have like, let's say you have a hair in the middle of your chin and it grows and you pluck it and then you start hormones and that hair in the middle of your chin still grows, that follicle has been, it's already started its hair growth situation before you started doing the hormones. So in order to permanently get rid of that hair, you would have to do like laser or electrolysis, but you shouldn't have new hair growth. So there shouldn't be new hairs that are starting to pop out once you have your hormones balanced, if they're balanced properly. So that's a good thing. And any hairs that you already had growing, you can always get, the laser is getting pretty inexpensive and pretty popular. So you can do laser. They used to do electrolysis. I don't even know if they do it anymore because laser kind of took over, but you can deal with that. And then at 76, Depending on, I don't know if your mom, dad, aunts and uncles, if any of them lived to 76, because a long time ago, we didn't live that long. But if they did, if you can think about, did they lose their hair? Or if you have any brothers and sisters or cousins who are your age, are they also losing their hair? It could be a little bit genetic. Our body, as we get older, it kind of thinks about like what processes aren't really necessary to our life and in our hair is not really necessary to our life. But other things I, I notice in women who are a little older tend to not eat enough protein. So eating protein is really important. Our hair is made of protein and making sure your protein levels are, like I said earlier, if you're listening, hundred grams of protein per hundred pounds. And then if you're for every five, for every inch over five feet, you are, you're going to add five pounds. So let's say you are five foot five, that's 125 grams of protein. That's how you're going to do that. So, or if you know what your ideal weight is, if you're like, oh, my weight is 120 pounds. I've been 120 pounds all my life. I feel good at this weight. Then it's 120 grams of protein. The reason why I don't say just what your body weight is, it's because if you weigh 250 pounds, that would be way too much protein to eat. That's not your ideal weight. Maybe your ideal weight is 150 pounds. So you're going to aim for 150 grams of protein per day. So protein, make sure your minerals are good. So make sure you're getting all of your nutrients. Stress is another reason why we lose hair. Viral and exposure, people on the back end of COVID-19 have lost a lot of hair. The good thing with stress, hormones, and sickness, usually what happens is the day that you have the stressor or the illness, usually the hair loss shows up three months after, but then once it's resolved, once the stress is resolved, once the nutrient deficiency is resolved, once the hormone imbalance is resolved, usually you can start growing the hair back. If none of that works, if it's genetic or there's another reason why you're losing hair, there is a over-the-counter, it's not natural, but it's called minoxidil. It is what Rogaine used to be. It's a generic of that. And it is FDA approved for use in women. You can, it's a topical that you put on your hair, wherever you think you're losing hair. You just put it on. You have to use it every day. And after about three to six months, you'll see if it's working, you'll start to grow little baby hairs back. I did a whole class on hair loss. It's live on my YouTube channel right now. So if you go to Fix Hormones with Dr. Michelle, you'll see that whole, whole video on hair loss. And there's a lot of different things I talk about and talk about the minoxidil and all the other reasons for hair loss. So hopefully that's helpful. What about the keto diet? It depends on the individual. Some people really need carbs to burn fat and to feel good and for their hormone balance. Carbs are important for fiber. 
So I am not like the hugest fan of the keto diet, but there are some people whose genetics really predispose them to doing really well on the keto diet. So it depends, but in general for women in menopause who want to balance their hormones, not a huge fan of totally keto. It depends. It depends on your genetics. So that's all I'll say. Let's see. I've been taking bioidentical hormones in a way to maintain my monthly period. Okay. I like the idea of getting rid of old blood and creating new blood cells. How do you feel about this? If you're in reproductive age, that's great. If you're over menopause, you are taking way too much hormones and you're doing it improperly. So I don't think that's a, a good protocol. You should be taking healthy physiological doses of hormones. Physiological just means what the human body is supposed to have will not produce a period in women who are in postmenopausal. If you start getting your period again, you might have some breakthrough bleeding. So you might have a month or two or three, we have a little spotting or something that's completely fine. But if you're taking hormones in a way to, to make you still get a period after menopause, you're excessively doing, taking hormones. So there's a, there's a protocol called the Wiley protocol that was actually created by a non-medical person. It's not used by any well-educated hormone doctors. So I don't recommend it. Let's see what numbers for each hormone. It depends on the type of testing that you're doing. So if you're doing blood testing, saliva testing, blood spot, and it depends if you are cycling, uh, which phase of your cycle you're in, if you're in menopause, if you're on hormone replacement. So all these different numbers, but I can't really spit them out just like this right here, but I'll probably do a blog post with the different reference ranges for you. And so if you want to see that, it's something I can do. I'm going to write that down because I think it's a good idea. So I will do a blog post with the reference ranges. But you can also, on any of my videos on YouTube, if you ask me for a reference, a specific reference range, I'm happy to give that to you. Let's see, I'm 51. I've not experienced hot flashes. However, I have lost 75% of my hair. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of hair. And for hair loss for women, it's not the same as hair loss for men. Men can lose their hair and be like distinguished and sexy. You know, they always like the actors when they're bald, like they're always like, oh, he's so sexy. And then if women lose their hair, it's like, oh my God, it's like a total social crisis. It's not just, it's not accepted for women to lose their hair. And it's part of like our whole style and who we are, right? So it's, that is, I know that can be very, very frustrated. My gynecologist only has me on testosterone drops. What are some tests I should be taking? She's refusing to put me on any type of hormone in order to help with the hair. So Testosterone, if you're only taking testosterone and you're 51, you're probably causing more hair loss with the drops. You definitely want to be taking estrogen and progesterone. Those are the things that are going to be supportive of your hair, where testosterone will make your hair fall out. So I would definitely go see another doctor or gynecologist. Just because she's a gynecologist, she might be really great at delivering babies and postpartum care and talking about the two girls about their periods. But she's probably not trained at all in menopause. You have a history of low thyroid. I'd definitely get that checked. So I would check your estrogen, your progesterone, your testosterone. I would also check your thyroid. So you want to check your free T3, your free T4, your total T4, your reverse T3, your TSH, and your thyroid antibodies, TPO and TBAG. I know it's a lot, but you can email support and we will send you a list of thyroid markers to check. Do you recommend putting your hormones on your skin or your labia? I recommend both. See, on your labia or your vulva, the whole vaginal area, that is good for vaginal dryness and vaginal symptoms like atrophy. On your skin, that is going to be for all your other systemic system, symptoms. Can you put in the chat that hormonal guide that is on your website? Oh, my book? Um... Good God, I don't have the, the link right here, but um, we will send out a replay of this tomorrow to everyone on our email list. I will put a link to our book in there. Link to the book. Okay, awesome. Going into perimenopause, or if you just go on our website, it pops up if you can enter your, your email and we'll email you the book, but I'll put a link in the, um, in the email. Going into perimenopause and having reoccurring women's issues like BV and UTIs, taking antibiotics, but it hasn't helped, it worsens issues. Yeah. So 
The reason why you're having increased issues like bacteria, vaginal urinary tract infections is because the microbiome of your whole vaginal area is has changed because it's dry. Your good bacteria can't live there anymore. It doesn't have enough moisture. So, and then by taking antibiotics, you're actually like killing off more of that good bacteria down there. So taking a lot of probiotics, that can be super helpful. There's actually some probiotic suppositories that you can use vaginally that can be helpful as well. Boric acid suppositories are also helpful. So those you can purchase on over the counter. And then replacing hormones can be super helpful as well. The reason why you have the dryness and the changes to your microbiome is the loss of estrogen, the loss of circulation, the loss of blood flow, and the loss of moisture. So hopefully that's some. And then even um, our hormone replacement program is called the Healthy Hormone Club. So Healthy Hormone Club, healthyhormoneclub.com, you'll get the, the, the page that talks about everything that's in it. And then for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't know if any of you have seen our, our masterclass that is basically everything every woman needs to know about hormone restoration. So I talk about the myths and misconceptions, all the different symptoms you might experience and the different types of hormones, how they're made. That's a free masterclass and that's at fixhormones.com. So fixhormones.com, if you haven't seen that yet, totally recommend it. Great masterclass. And then at the end of that, we talk about how you can work with us, but you can use the information in that masterclass to go to any doctor and be totally empowered and educated about what you need. History of DVT. So that's like clotting. Is that a, a contraindication for BHRT? Oral BHRT? Yes. Topical? No. So topical hormones do not have any issues with DVT. No uterus, still got ovaries. All right, you're getting stomach hormones. Only symptoms so far is hot flashes. I eat well, exercise. My doctor said no to estrogen because I get the odd migraine. Very rare that was your thought. I'm 50. It's not a reason why you shouldn't have estrogen. You should just get progesterone as well. And progesterone might help with your migraines. So it's not a reason why you can't have estrogen. It's probably, it's the reason why you should not have oral estrogen though. So a lot of doctors don't know the difference or they don't know the, the intricacies of the different types of hormones and they'll consider synthetic, oral, bioidentical, topical, pellets, they'll consider all the same thing. And I don't blame them because a lot of the studies, if you read like studies on PubMed or some of the research studies, and they're talking about conjugated equine estrogen, but then if you're down further in the study, they just call it estrogen. You're like, wait, it's not estrogen. It's conjugated equine estrogen. Same thing with medroxy, progesterone, acetate. It's a progestin, but later down the road, they call it progesterone. It can be very confusing for doctors who haven't had the training. Let's see. Should I add the hot flashes? Should I add? Oh, I should add that hot flashes come and go. Certainly more intense and lacking sleep now due to sweating at night. Yeah. So, and when you think about it, so if you're not sleeping, that's going to mess up your metabolism. It's going to mess with your um, total circadian rhythm. It's going to make you so more susceptible to sickness and viruses and bacterial infections because your immune system is downregulated. It's going to mess with your digestion. So all of these things trickle down and it also makes you irritable, can make you depressed, it can make you make bad decisions, can give you brain fog. So <laughs> lack of sleep alone is a reason I feel like to take hormone replacement. Uh, is blood work a sufficient test to determine starting levels of BHRT? Yeah, it is. So blood testing is fine for if you're not on any hormones. Once you start hormones, if you are on topical hormones, a serum test is not going to be able to detect your proper hormone levels. So you don't need a Dutch test. A Dutch test is great. A Dutch test will show you your the way your hormones break down, but it's not exactly your total hormones. It is a estimation of your total hormones because they're looking at the metabolic byproducts of your hormones in your urine. So they're called hormone metabolites. And so it's not actually the actual hormone levels on that test. It's an estimate. Like they don't even give you a number for progesterone because they can't even estimate that. So I do love that test though for cortisol. It gives you melatonin. It gives you the metabolites of estrogen, which is great because it shows you if you're breaking your estrogen down the pathway that causes DNA damage, and that DNA damage is what feeds the stem cells, which causes cancer. So the estrogen itself is not bad. It's how it breaks down in some people. And one of the things that you can do if you have your estrogen breaking down the wrong pathway is you can actually take DIM, 
which is I put that right in my daily glow supplement because dim is helpful to push that pathway down the um, more favorable, healthy estrogen detox pathway. So yes, blood levels are fine for starting hormone replacement. Once you're on hormone replacement, if you're on topical hormone replacement, you want to do saliva or a blood spot so that you can actually see what your levels are. Let's see, a blood test shows I'm prone to clotting. I have no symptoms. I haven't been put on medication. My doctor gave me a garlic pill or a baby aspirin to prevent clotting. He said, never take estrogen. You should never take oral estrogen or oral progesterone or synthetic progesterone, I should say. So never take oral estrogen, never take oral synthetic progesterone, and that will cause blood clots. If you take topical bioidentical estrogen, topical bioidentical progesterone, you will have no increased risk of clotting. You can actually read, if you don't believe me, you can actually read the North American Menopause Society's position statement that came out earlier this year. And they are very clear on the research there. I also have a list of studies that talk about all these things, but it's very, very different. And the doctor that told you that just thinks that all hormones are the same, all delivery methods are the same, and they are very, very different. My skin has thin. Is there any advantage to applying bioidentical estrogens to your face? The verdict is still out of whether you actually have to apply it to your face or whether if that gives you any added benefit, but I can tell you that a secret of the beauty industry, a lot of these department store beauty creams that you can buy for hundreds of dollars, some of them actually have undisclosed estrogen in them. So that's why sometimes when we see a hormone test, we tell our, our patients like before the hormone test, stop using your anti-aging creams because it might contaminate your test. But so you can, I wouldn't recommend putting lots of it on there, but you can put a little bit of like your estrogen, if you're on a topical estrogen cream, you can put a little bit of cream in your skincare a couple of times a week. That would be fine. Just don't do it within two weeks if you're doing a saliva test because you can contaminate your saliva test, but just applying it topically, it's going to get into your bloodstream and it's going to allow for the collagen and elastin to be built up. So you don't have to do it on your face. I'm not sure. I haven't seen any research about applying it straight to the face of being um, any additional benefit. So I can't really tell you 100% for sure. It probably won't hurt you. If you do your first year, your plan for $13.99, you want to continue for the rest of your life. What do you do for the years? What do you do after the first year is possible? Right now, we are just honoring that same price. So you, you kind of lock in your price at least for the next five years. I cannot, because I don't know the future, I cannot tell what's going to happen with inflation or our, the cost of our testing or the cost of shipping. So if inflation like doubles, like if the dollar is only worth 50 cents after five years, then we're going to have to raise the price a little bit. We won't, won't just raise the price arbitrarily. It will be because we can't afford to offer any more at that price. We already have a pretty slim margin. We try my goal in like my practice in my life is to make a change in the way menopausal women are treated and in the way they get to live the rest of their life. And so I really love offering it for a low cost. So if you break that up, like $116 a month, if you pay it the annual, if you pay monthly, we do charge you on $139 a month because we have to do all the billing and stuff, but it's very, very affordable. Can you consider if you are someone who takes supplements and you take two high quality supplements, they can sometimes be $50 each. So that's your cost of your hormone replacement and your testing and your consultation and your support. So it's really affordable. But yes, you lock in that price at least for the next five years. I can't foresee it will happen in the future if we're unable to offer at that cost. We will have to raise the price if, like I said, if inflation goes through the roof. I don't know. But yes, you're safe for at least the next five years. And if we can keep it at that price, we will. What do you think about trochies? If they're bioidentical, they, they're fine if you're feeling good on them. It depends on your symptoms. With trochies, the thing is that sometimes you swallow a lot of it, not because you want to, just inadvertently. I've done trochies before and I end up swallowing more than I let dissolve. And so then it turns into oral, right? So if you're doing estrogen, I still kind of feel like oral estrogen could, or, or trochies of estrogen can be oral and it could cause some issues. But if that's you, if you're feeling good, then that's totally fine. I watched your hormone webcast and, and twice. Oh, awesome. I'm very interested in doing bioidentical HRT, but it has kicked me off when I try to sign in. Oh, 
go to healthyhormoneclub.com. That's kind of about the page where you can learn about the program and you can purchase it. Just click the button and you should be fine. It might have just been your internet connection or it could have been something weird. Technology, you know, the other day, none of our webinar reminders went out for some reason. I don't know why. If you're doing a webinar, nobody showed up because the webinar reminders didn't go out until the next day. <laughs> so, you know, but try again. If you have any issues, just please, Marsha, um, email us at support at glownaturalwellness.com and we will help you. I could have one of my, my associates uh, give you a call and help you. Let's see. I do you understand? Did I understand you saying that if yeah, I have cancer stage four non Hopkins lymphoma that I cannot take the issue? No, only if you have breast cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, only if you have hormone related cancers, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, that is a different type of cancer. You can totally take hormone replacement therapy. It doesn't affect it. Same thing like if you have colon cancer or something like that, you can still take hormone replacement therapy. What kinds of tests do you use before prescribing bioidentical hormones? We test estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Okay, let's see. Do you recommend taking long-term bioidentical hormones? What I'm doing this right for you. So everybody has their own idea of what is right for them. So if you take hormones, bioidentical hormones for five to 10 years, then you, you do have a built-in like benefit. So the, the research is that if you take hormones for like five to 10 years, then you have another five to 10 years of protection against breast cancer, against different types of cancer. You have a lowered risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, dementia, because you've had those hormones for that time. So even after you stop using them, you still have that benefit of having those extra hormones. So if you decide you don't want to take them after a certain amount of time, I, I'm not going to judge you or anything like that. I think you have to do what's right for you. But personally, me, I, I'm going to take hormones until I die because I, I'm really, I, my son's only seven and I'm 49 and, and I want to, I know I'm going to be like a hundred and he's going to be what, like 50. <laughs> so I want to make sure I'm around for him as long as possible and as vibrant and youthful and energetic as possible. And so that's my idea. And, and I, I understand the, the benefits and such little risks of the types of hormones I'm on. I'll always test my hormones. I'll always make sure that I'm not in a higher level, that I'll adjust my hormones if needed. So yeah, I think it's totally fine. Tanya, I just joined the Healthy Hormone Club. Yay. Yeah, I actually saw you in there, Tanya. I saw, I can tell, like, I get notifications. Oh, Tanya completed module one. So it's awesome. We're so excited to have you. I just reviewed your intake form yesterday. So your tests will go out on Monday. My cycle length varies. Should I still test between 19 and 21? Let's see. She had 40 day cycle, 20 day cycle, 27 days, 54, 25. Uh, it's a little tricky. Here's what I would do if you can. At any local pharmacy, you can get ovulation predictor kit. If you can figure out when you ovulate, then test five to seven days after that. That's what we're trying to get to is five to seven days after ovulation. Now you're still getting a period roughly every month. So that's great. But yeah, so October, I don't know if you're very missed your window for, for testing. No, you shouldn't have. So October you had your period. So I would still, I would go... Yeah, because you're 2027, 20, 25. I go 19. So try a test on day 19. If like for some reason it looks weird, we'll retest you, but we'll still be able to make that judgment based on your symptoms. So let's try that. And then once your hormones are a little more balanced, you might have a more regulated cycle and we'll be able to test you again. So with our Healthy Hormone Club, we say we test every four months, but if someone needs an additional test for the specific situation, then, you know, <laughs> we'll always give you extra testing if you need it. So Tanya, I would go for day 19. If your period comes before that, just give us a call and then just make sure you keep track of when you get your period. So if you get it like day, what would have been day 28, 29, 30, if you get it less than 40 days, then that's good. If you get it over 40 days, then we're probably going to want to retest or go off your symptoms. But don't worry, we got gotcha. you. We'll take care of it. Just let us know as soon as you know how many days this cycle was. Or try the ovulation kit. That's probably, that's a no-nonsense way to do it. That'll give you the best result. That's, can I pay for one-off or perhaps two consultations with one of your team members to advise on dosage from bioidentical hormones I already have? We don't do that. Whoever prescribed your bioidentical hormones, you should be getting 
do a thing from them. It's not really a good practice to for someone to prescribe hormones and then someone else to tell them how to use them. So we actually don't do that. We can do one-off like we didn't hormone test, but we won't give you dosing unless you're in our hormone program. It's not because we're trying to be mean. It's just we don't want to go against whoever is already who you're already working with. If you don't feel comfortable with them, then I would recommend going to see somebody else. And we would need testing in order to, we need recent testing in order to even help you with, with the, what we think your dosing should be. Awesome. I think I got all the questions in the Q&A. I know we're long, I mean, we're two hours now. If you had further questions, please go ahead and email them to support at If you're watching on the replay, or if you want to watch the replay again, because you want to catch something again, or just when we send the replay out tomorrow, it's actually better instead of emailing support with more questions, wait till we send the replay out, out tomorrow and comment under the video with your question. And I do check those all the time. So I'll be answering those all day tomorrow, either via text or typing my question, my answer in, or I may make an extra video to explain your answers. So hope you guys enjoyed this. Everyone who won a prize, don't forget to email support at glownaturalwellness.com. If you want to join a healthy hormone club, we'd love to have you. You can go to healthyhormoneclub.com and check that out. Or if you have not seen the masterclass yet, I totally urge you to watch it. Whether you're thinking about hormone replacement or not thinking about it, whether you're already on it, whether you want to work with a local doctor, fixhormones.com, fixhormones.com. That is goes straight to sign up for one of the next masterclasses that we're holding. Even if you don't want to watch it, the time that's listed, just pick a time. We'll send you a replay the next day. Anyway, it's so nice having you guys here. I think I got most of the questions. If you ask a question in the chat, I might have missed it because I was reading the Q&A mostly, but I am going to download the chat. And oh, do you, do you recommend local docs in Manhattan? I don't have the ability to like know which doctors are great, but I am going to a conference at A4M. So the American Academy of Anti-Aging, doctors from all around the country who are wanting to learn about hormones, anti-aging, longevity. So I will be there in December and I will be on the lookout for doctors in your area, but comment under my YouTube and I will ask around. Uh, so you want doctors in Manhattan? Let's see. I think I got most of the questions. So I will download the chat and I'll make some more videos for you guys. Better time of day to apply estrogen. How about DHEA? I like DHEA in the morning because it's energizing and it helps with like mental acuity and it helps with a lot of things like with your brain and your muscles and energizing. Estrogen can be in the morning or night. Estrogen can help you if you wake up from sleep, like if you fall asleep, okay, but then you have trouble, you wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. Estrogen can help with that. Also, if you have hot flashes or night sweats at night, I usually do estrogen split dose or sometimes only in the morning if there's no issues with sleep. Estrogen can be a little bit energizing to your cells, but not usually like amp you up, like not be able to fall asleep. So that's how I like to dose it. Progesterone, I usually always do at night unless we're splitting the dose or using a combination cream, then I'll do some in the morning and some at night, but more at night. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna let you go. Thank you for everyone who's thanking me in the Q&A and the chat. Of course, you guys, I am here for you. I am all about empowering women, giving you this information because it's not out there. And I just hope that it's helpful. Please do reach out. Please watch my YouTube channel because it really helps to get the message out to other women. When you guys watch it, it tells YouTube that this is important information and let's show it to some other women. It's, the YouTube channel is called Fix Hormones with Dr. Michelle. If you type that all in the search, Fix Hormones with Dr. Michelle, you'll get to my channel. I have lots of videos on there about a lot of things that you guys asked about. I go in a little more detail and I'm always looking for new topics. So I will be using some of your questions as topics for YouTube as well. All right, you guys have a great night. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.